My special guest today is joining us from Kent in the UK. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show English comedian, Mr. Paul Adams. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Joe. You? Paul, we worked together on the Sea Wing cruise ship. There was <laughs> very little work, if we're honest. Don't try to <laughs> pretend to your listeners that we worked at all. We didn't. We chatted and got in trouble, right? We had some laughs. We got in a bit of trouble. What a contract that was. Do you know what? I had Paul Beck, our cruise director, from that contract on the show a few weeks back. There was a cruise director? Do you remember the pedal car ride we did in Kishadasi? I believe we got the oldest guy we could find, and he took us into town, which was only a few minutes' walk. But we fancied it, and then he just stayed with us all day, right? Yeah, you and me, poor little skinny Turkish fella, pedaling us all over town from bar to bar. Yeah, it was good no. times, though. When you go on a ship like that, the Sea Wing was my first ever cruise ship. I worked on it maybe... When did we work together? 2001? Yeah. Have you worked on it before, though? I worked on it in 95, end of 95, when it was owned by Air Tours. And then it moved over to... When I worked with you, I think a Greek company was booking it, wasn't it? It was Global International, yeah. I think it was their first ship. So they didn't know what they were doing, which is a good indication, because both you and I were on it. (laughs) I remember the monthly bar bills. It was... um, yeah, they were. It, that was the only contract I've done where I wish I'd sold merchandise. <laughs> Any memories that really stand out for you on that on that contract? On that contract, if I'm absolutely honest, I have I have such a bad memory, and this is going to sound awful now or cliche, which is worse, is that I think that to to have made a friendship like we made, and we haven't really spoken much over the last few years. It, you and I, Paul Adams and Joe Wormsley, it wasn't a ship thing, was it? It lasted. <laughs> We met up on land. That's 20 years ago, and we're still talking. I mean, I've had a marriage that hasn't lasted that long. (laughs) Who was that singer who came on board with you? We call you guys fly-ins. We were the production cast. We were there for the whole nine, ten months, whatever. You come on a couple of times through the contract. Yeah, yeah, we were there nine nine months or something. No wonder you were drinking so much. (laughs) Fair ship, very stressful. I had to learn how to dance on the spot. You say learn like you managed it. (laughs) (laughs) But what was that girl's name? You came on with a girl singer. Uh, Yeah, I remember now. Suzanne. Gail? Was it Gail? Suzanne Gail, yeah. She's a cruise director now. I saw her, no, not on Sea Wing, that was our ship, on Seabourn. Seabourn, that's very different from Sea Wing. You don't want to get those two mixed up if you're booking a ship. Yeah, she was cruise director on there when I was, and I was the act. Um, so a lot of people have progressed in their lives. I've just done the same thing for 25 years now, something. We worked on that contract 20 years ago. I still can't believe it, man. It's 20 years ago. And I was saying the same to Paul Beck when he came on the show. But I saw you a few times after that. Uh, you did a show with Gene Pitney. You opened for Gene Pitney at the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool. Because you got me and my friend, Joe Calhoun, tickets, my good friend back home. Do you remember that night? I'm very generous. Yes, I, I, I do. Across the road from the Philharmonic Halls is a pub called the Philharmonic, right? That's right, yeah. And somebody had said to me, maybe before that show, or before a time that I was going to be in Liverpool, said to me, you must visit the gentleman's toilet in the Philharmonic pub. It's famous. And I'm like, why? And somebody, and they said, it's, they're like the most ornate toilets in the world. And, I, and so this information is in my head, and I forget about it. And I'm outside <laughs> the Philharmonic halls going through my joke, and, um, and I see the pub. And I think, oh, I've got to go to that pub, and I can't remember why. So I wander over to the pub, I walk in, and then it starts to take form in my head what I'm doing there. <laughs> and I walk into the toilets, and these toilets are incredible. They're the most beautiful toilets I've ever seen. And I walk in, there's a guy standing there having a, a wee-wee, and he just looks at me and goes, nice, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> like, it happens to him all the time. It was brilliant. That's where Paul McCartney played on. I don't know whether you saw the James Corden carpool karaoke with Paul McCartney. Oh, uh, no, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen that? No. You're probably the only person I know who hasn't seen that. Okay, I mean, oh. it's on over here, the late show with James Corden, but James Corden's from your neck of the woods, right? Is he? I don't know everybody who lives here. It's a small country, Joe, but come on. But that's where Paul McCartney played on the carpool karaoke. He'd done the gig in there at the James film. James Corden I'm very familiar with, but who's this Paul McCartney you're going on about? He plays a bit of bass, um, holds a couple of tunes, yeah. See, if he played but, the drums, I'd remember. <laughs> Well, this past week, just gone, it was Ringo's birthday. He was 81 last week, Ringo. Same day as my dad. Do you think we'll be around when we're in our 80s? Who knows, man. I mean, after that, especially after the Sea Wing contract. I do remember it. I remember the the, the contract. I mean, I remember there's other people we met on there. I remember 
but there was a dancer called Leanne from Scotland. I saw her again. There's a lot of good people on that ship, but it was fun times. And, and the ships have, have changed a little bit. And they're going to be even more different when we go back now after this. But, you know, I'd come on and I'd feel like I was part of the team with you guys. And it was a laugh. It was, wasn't it? And, and, that, and that made the show, I can't even remember, to be honest, I don't remember doing any shows on that ship. <laughs> well, you did, because I've got photographs. Have you? Yeah, I think there's a video going around probably as well. No, there's not. I'd like to see that. Yeah. I'd like to see it because I've got to do a show in a couple of weeks and I've not done one for 16 months and I'm trying to remember my act. <laughs> Has it been 16 months? Well, because, you know, I know the... Uh... The pandemic hit the industry big time. You know, it's a lot of people, a lot of professions, but the entertainment yeah. business, it really did hit. And I know a lot of people were doing, including myself, the live streams. So many were doing the virtual thing, but virtual thing for a comic, not as effective, right? Without a live audience. It must have been... I did one. I didn't, I was forever um, being off, not forever. I got offered a lot of the online gigs and I kept saying no, no. And I'd recommend other comedians because they were better at it than I was. And eventually this one guy offered me one. And then, uh, and I went to the comic that I would usually go to, and he said, "No, Paul, this is quite a lot of money. You should do it." And I was like, "I've never done it. I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I'm no good at that stuff." So I did it purely for the money, and it was so much fun. And I immediately regretted having turned down all the others because it isn't an ideal format. But what you can do, I'm doing this like I know we're not, no, no, people can't see us, but I had the my what do you call it? Um, iPad thing, yep. and I, it's only a small audience, maybe only 18 people, but I could see every single one of them. Like the little squares the around, yeah. Yeah, and yep. even better, it had their names underneath it. So if somebody didn't laugh at a joke, not only did I know that they weren't laughing, because I could <laughs> see them clearly, but I knew who they were, you know, so, so yeah. I could, I used that to my advantage. Yeah. So they were a lot of fun, and you've got to adapt. Whatever you do, you've got, we've got to adapt. And I didn't do, I think it was, I got off a ship on April 3rd last, yeah, last year. And I've done maybe eight or nine Warner Hotels since then. Okay. So that's it. I was just saying, from a musician's point of view, they're requesting songs and you're just playing like I was playing. But it, yeah. I, I, I could just imagine it to be a different scenario for a comic. I don't know, because, you know, as a comic, you expect a reaction maybe three times a minute. But as a singer, you don't. You, you expect a reaction at the end of the song. After the right? song, yeah. yeah. So that might have been harder, because you, you do like three minutes of let's call it work and, then, <laughs> and nobody claps. What do you, what do you, you must think, Oh, I'm used to that. Go. No, as a comedian, yeah, as a comedian <laughs> and, and the, the level of comic that I am, I've had so many shows with no laughter. That it was just second nature. <laughs> no problem at all. What about the Make Em Laugh tour? That's another time I saw you after we finished the ships. You did the Make Em Laugh tour with Norman Collier, Duncan Norvell, Jimmy Cricket and Frank Carson. I was at that show also at the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool. And it was packed. That was a fantastic so night. I'm trying to work out if you're a friend of mine <laughs> or a stalker or just use me for free tickets. Free tickets, yeah, and a night out. I've got to say, from the off, that show, it was a night... Do you want to hear the whole, the whole idea of how the show came about? Yeah, come on. Right, OK. Um, this is actually in a book I'm writing about my dad as well. But, mm. um, so... I used to do a lot of the opening act stuff, as you know, like um, uh, Gene Pitney, yep. Stylistics. You know, I've done, I've opened up for some pretty decent names and I became that act. And uh, Flying Music, run by a guy called Derek Nicol and Paul Walden, they, I used to do a lot of shows for them. And one day I was wandering around the foyer at the theatre and they had a bunch of posters for their another show that they did called the Solid Silvers, Solid Silver 60s show or something like that. And it was a bunch of stars from that era who on their own couldn't fill a theatre, but collectively probably could. So I wrote up the idea and I faxed it the next day. That's how long ago it was. I never heard back from Derek Nicol. And about, I don't know, a year later, I mean, another foyer in a theatre and Derek's there and we're chatting away and, and we see a theatre, a, a show for the solid 60s comedy show, a solid 60s rock and roll show, whatever it was. And I said to him, I can't believe you didn't like my comedy idea for that. He said, what comedy idea? I said, I faxed it to you yeah, about a year ago. He said, I never got the facts. So I told him about the idea and he loved it. And the next day he called me up. And have you ever seen a movie called The Firm with Tom Cruise? I have, yeah. Right. Now he said in that film, a fax is sent and it falls off the fax machine and rolls underneath the desk. That's right. Never to be found. That's what happened to that fact. Within a week, we had our dream list. I'm sitting in the office with Derek Nicol, Paul Walden, a guy called Andy Sharrocks, my dad, Charlie, and, um, and me. We're sitting in the office 
and we're talking about make them laugh. I'm looking at, I've got a post up in the office here. It's the only post I've got. It's not a showbiz office. Um, and we've got Frank Carson, Duncan Norvell, Jimmy Cricket, Norman Collier. And everyone's very happy with the, the lineup that we've got. Frank Carson's a genius. Norman Collier was ahead of his time. He was a wonderful comedian. And, um, and Derek Nichols says, who should we get to host this show? So I said, well, you've got to get Kevin Devan or Adrian Walsh if you've got a lot of money or um, um, Martin Beaumont. I lift all these comedians off and everybody's laughing. I'm like, what are you laughing at? So we think you should do it. I was like, oh, I never thought of me. And really, I was the obvious choice. I'm a comedian and it was my idea, right? Yeah. And, and then, so about a month later, we opened, no, longer than that, a couple of months later, we opened in Norwich at the Theatre Royal and um, I'm given the star dressing room. But ahead of Frank, I'm given the, the number one dressing room. Frank insisted on it because I'd done so much work for it and I ferried him around and he gave me the star's dressing room and, uh, and my dad walks into the dressing room and there's, there's um, Frank, Norman uh, and the techies who I, I believe are both called Bob, but I might have got that wrong. And my dad walks in and, uh, and Frank's saying, you've got to be proud of your boy. Look what he's done. He's put on this show. He's got us all together. He's hosting it and he's laying his plays on me. And my dad said, where is he now? And Frank said, I sent him out for pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that, Joe. I mean, I was sitting in a car for two tours of about 25 nights each with Frank Carson. Can you imagine how much I learned? Well, what I was going to say to you was the night I saw the show was in Liverpool. You, me and the great Frank Carson went drinking at the Malt House Hotel in Liverpool after the show. I think Frank was 75 then. He drank us under the table. Oh, the guy is... I mean, the guy could do... He didn't understand the word excessive. He was... He, he remains the funniest person I think I've ever met, genuinely. People say Frank Carson never came off stage, and I disagree. Frank Carson never went on stage. He was himself. That was him. Yeah. If you're walking down the street and Frank walks past, he'll say hello and tell you five minutes worth of jokes, and you'll laugh at every single one of them. Well, I remember the night we sat with him there in the moat house, and uh, his granddaughter was there with her friends, and she was asking, can you get me tickets, granddad, for Westlife? He said, like, when's the gig? And he was... <laughs> That was my bad Belfast accent there, but uh, I always remember that. And I remember Ricky Thomason joined us at one point because he'd been to the premiere of um, 51st State, it was called there. Uh, out here, it's called Formula 51, the old movie he did with Samuel L. Jackson. And, uh, okay. Michael Stark was in that as well, a uh, Liverpool actor. But I remember Ricky joined us at some point. But it was about four in the morning I left, and I remember you telling me at a later date that Duncan Ferguson came in, and I'd missed that. Duncan Ferguson came in, the, oh, the big footballer guy, right? Frank is, um, is recognisable. He's a, he was a, when he, he's obviously not around anymore, but he was an instantly recognisable face. Yeah. And if he didn't recognise his face and he opened his mouth, you still recognised him. And so Duncan came over and starts talking to, to Frank like they're old buddies. Duncan's a bit unsteady on his feet. Are we allowed to talk about this? I don't know. It's too late now. <laughs> Duncan, have you you been drinking, Duncan? Now, well, he wasn't playing football. Then I think he had a game that night. He wasn't playing for a few. Months. I'm not suggesting he did anything wrong. Okay. But Frank said, "How many have you had?" And Duncan said, "Too many," and fell over. And there was <laughs> nobody in the room strong enough to lift him up. He's a big fella, isn't he? Big Glaswegian. But uh, that was a great night. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I missed that bit at the end. But I remember the rest of the night was fantastic, sitting with Frank all night. And he was just an incredibly the... generous man. He stayed when we were down south. We stayed in my flat. And when we were up north, we stayed in his palatial home. And he, would, he wouldn't take the bed in my house. He would take the couch. Wow. He was a lovely, lovely... And I lost him. One day I lost him. <laughs> I, I was doing a radio show at the time. And so we'd done a show the night before. I'd go off, get up early in the morning, go and do the radio, come back. And Frank's not in the house. And the house... Well, it was a big house that had three flats. And my sister lived downstairs. That's important for the story. Okay. So I think, I've lost Frank Castle. I can't find him. And I ring the phone and it's in the kitchen. So I don't know where he is. So I go across to the paper shop. They haven't seen him. And Frank, I lived in this town for a couple of years and nobody knew who I was. Frank was there for about 28 minutes and everybody <laughs> knew him. So eventually I go down to the cafe, a little greasy spoon. I say, is Frank here? No, no, we don't know where he is. I like, where's he gone? I'm really nervous because we've got a show to leave for now. And I go back home and in desperation, I knock on my sister's door and she opens the door and she looks fed up. And then I hear a laugh in the background, which can only be one person. And there's Frank in his pants and vest. <laughs> Sitting in your sister's? <laughs> yeah, he to get a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich and stayed. My sister was seeing a guy uh, who he, she ended up marrying, and uh, and he was just completely aghast that this legend was in 
in the flat, you know, couldn't believe it. Yeah. And, but to us, after our, I grew up with a, with a comedy writer, so it wasn't unusual for us to have comedians in the house. So well. but he's, I love him to pieces. I miss him terribly. He ring me up one night. He rang me up. My phone said Frank Carson. I panicked. It's three o'clock. Oh, no, what's happened to Frank? And he's just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what's going on? He said, I can't sleep. I said, why not? He said, I can't shut my safe. There's too much money in it. And hang up. <laughs> <laughs> Love him. Anyway. My first trip to America was New York in 2002. And you and your dad were there at the same time. We went to your gig at the Comedy Club. Comedy Club, yeah. Yeah, it was a privilege to me because I, I finally met your dad. I'd heard so much about. I remember your dad went back to the hotel. Kay Chairman from the Sea Wing, she was with us. She went back to the hotel. So you and me went drinking. We said, where's the best place to go? You know, a bit of music and stuff. I remember someone telling us, there's a place called Cleopatra's Needle. It's a jazz club. And I'm like, oh, I'd love to see the jazz in New York. Let's do that. So we're walking around aimlessly, you and me. Next thing, we're down this back alley. We didn't know where we were going. <laughs> and there was a shoe shine guy in the alley. Now it's probably like two in the morning. And he's like, hey, where are you going, guys? And I remember you saying to him, we're looking for the place called the uh, Cleopatra's Needle. It's a club, a jazz club. So I know where it is, but I've got to shine your shoes first. And I remember looking at your feet. Do you remember? He looked at you and he said, I can't shine them shoes because you had like baseball boots on. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, I'll shine your shoes. So he shined my shoes. We said, so where's the club? He said, oh, it's $5 for your shoe shine. So I'll give him the $5. Well, he, sh he shined your shoes for $5. Yeah. What well, he said to me, I remember this because this, again, might well be in the book. Um, he said to me, you got to give me $5 as well. I said, you haven't shined my shoes. He said, give me $5 if I can tell you where you got those shoes where you got those shoes. And I said, okay, fine. And he said, they're on 24th and 5th. And that's where we were geographically in New York. So the phrasing of the question was exactly right. He <laughs> told me where those shoes were at that <laughs> moment in time. So I gave him the $5. But Joe, here's the best thing. <sighs> that was 2001, no, two. Two, two yeah. Two? yeah. Right. A few years later, I'm in New York again. I'm on my own. There's no dad. There's no Joe Wormsley. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm on my own. I'm walking down the street and the same guy, well, I don't know it's the same guy, but this guy says to me, I can tell you where you got them shoes for $5. And I look at him and I instantly recognize him as being that guy. You are I kidding, say, really? I, I swear to you, I'm not joking. And, <laughs> and he said to me, uh, I tell you, I said, I know who you are. You've done this to me before, but I couldn't remember what the joke was. So I said, yeah, do it again. And he said, 42nd and 7th. And I went, that's it. And I gave him $5 <laughs> and we just laughed. It was brilliant. I swear that's true. I hate stories that end with the guy saying, I swear that's true. But I promise you. But I did, I'd forgotten the whole shoe sign bit beforehand. I'd forgotten the bit. I have to. I need to rewrite that story. He told us where the club was. There was a lot of jazz going on. We went there. And after that, we wanted to go carry on. And he said, there's a place called The Dive. And you said, where, where have we come from? That's that's bad. But we went. We ended up in a place called The Dive at like five in the morning or something. But we're still here, mate. All stories are based around drinking. I thought we had a drink for <laughs> a decade. We, we just had a laugh. I, I mean, how, you're a couple of years older than me, right? I'm 52, yeah. Right, you're, okay, you're... I'm not 50 yet. Okay. In my real age or my showbiz age. <laughs> and But the point is, um, we when we work together, so if I was 21, I'm not even 30. So you're just turned 30. We're having a, a laugh. We're travelling the world. Yep. You know, we're surrounded by good people. <laughs> we're doing something that, that wasn't, at no point, can you class what we did as work. Do you, do you know what I mean? It was not hard work. Especially for me, I'd come in and do maybe one night or two nights. You were doing five. I know. I mean, our night off was when the comedian was on and the singer. That's why I was asking you about the girl earlier because you had the singer on and you had the comedian on. They were our nights off. Our night off, sorry, one night off a week in the whole contract. And that was uh, when you guys were on stage, yeah? The comedian and the singer. That room on the sea wing was not an easy room to work. I remember it had, it had an audience down the side, didn't it? Yeah, it was like a little well, auditorium, yeah. You had the wings. I did like it. it, was, it there were good times and, 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 and we, we got a decent friendship out of it. We're going to go, you're going to take me to, where are you taking me to? Austin, right? When you come over, I'll take you to Austin, yeah. It's an hour away from me. We'll you... do that. We'll, we'll try and find an area that hasn't got any bars. I don't think I could drink like, like we did when I was 29. Could we? No. I don't know. You work in a pub every night, don't you? Five nights a week, yeah. <laughs> Wax O'Connor's, do you plug it at all? Can I plug it? You're yeah, not Wax O'Connor's, yeah, plug it. Wax, yeah. Have, have you mentioned it? Was our, our listeners going, yeah, we know about Waxy's Paul, we mentioned <laughs> it once, don't worry about it. <laughs> Actually, the owner does a jingle on the show. 
to say. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is Phil, Wax Your Connors Irish Pub in Texas, the owner of Wax Your Connors. You listen to Joe Worms, your next part radio. That's when I come in, telling them how many nights I play and what time and stuff. The radio must be fun. You must enjoy that. It's great. You know, you know, and it's good having the freedom um, that Dave, the owner, gives me, you know, with the music and the stuff and uh, got some of my own jingles and... Um, the, the bit I love is this bit, the guests. I've been so blessed to have so many, you know, I've met so many great people over the years doing this business. And um, I've had some fantastic guests on, you know, and everyone's been so kind to just come on. Just out of interest, how many shows have you done on the radio? This is the 25th. And have you had a guest every night? Except two shows, I'm going to say except two shows. But yeah. What I'm angling at, Joe, is that it sounds like before me you've had 23 guests. <laughs> I'm number 24, so I'm now wondering... How great a friend I am! <laughs> I find myself <laughs> languishing down at the top number twenty-four. It's not a league table. It is in my head. <laughs> where, where was um? What number guest was John Martin? John was about. Oh, let's see. Where are we now? I'm going to say John was about six weeks ago, maybe six, seven weeks ago. No, what you should have said then to placate me is, is uh, John's on next week. <laughs> Do the, do the listeners know where the show is coming from? I do from San Antonio, Texas, but it goes up in 115 countries. Well, what I'm worried about, because I can see you, I know they can't see us. Right, but I'm a bit worried about the, uh, your child's mobile hanging from the ceiling. It's going around very quickly. Which? The mobile, you know the little toy that goes above the cot? <laughs> <laughs> is that a fan? A mobile? <laughs> no, I've just seen a fan. Like, you, know the, you know the little things that babies play with that go around in a, in a gentle circle to help them sleep? She's ten. I know, but it's, I'm going for the comedy here. I don't know. Let's talk about your dad. It was an honour for me to meet Charlie Adams in New York. And um, let's talk about you, because your dad was a comedy writer for the great Bob Hope. Yeah, he, I mean, well, look at me now. I'm, I'm sitting up straight in my chair. I'm, I'm, you've got all my attention, because I, do, I don't mind doing interviews I'd, I'd much rather do them with the mate like, like we are and i'll have fun doing it but i tell you what you ask me to talk about my dad you may as well tell your listeners that there's going to be no more songs tonight i could talk about the man yeah. all day I, you know how much i loved him he is my hero he's my mentor i'm writing a, a book about him it's kind of it's more about me and him our relationship and stuff and and we're halfway through the edit and i can't wait to finish it and it's just so everything all these stories like my dad are, are fresh in my head and he was a legend. He was a legend. He was a, you know, he he is arguably the, the greatest gag writer of his generation, arguably. I mean, there's other great gag writers, don't get me wrong. But so many people wanted my dad. That speaks for itself. Bob Hope, you know, Monkhouse over here. Yeah. Um, predominantly over here. I mean, I guess, I mean, it's an international, well, no, it's expats, isn't it? So it's all yeah. English people who are now, right, so commercially, the most successful show he did was probably Noel's House Party, right? But he wrote for Everybody going from Frankie Howard and, and Les Dawson and coming through the years to like um, uh, Tarbuck, you know, and, and then the, the new guys, when they were coming through, the new guys, when they were like Shane Ritchie and Bradley Walsh, yeah. Brian Connolly, all these people, Davro. I could go on forever listing all the names of the people he worked with. And, and he was just brilliant. He was a jovial little chap. You, you met him. You I know met what him. it was like. That's the only time I did meet him, them few days in New York. But we had a fantastic yeah. time, and he was so funny, you know, just very, very dry. Um, but but you got to actually meet Bob Hope with your father, right? Well, yeah. Well, Dad, um, Dad wrote for him in I think I can tell you when I can tell you when he wrote for him. Can I go over there very quickly? Yeah. Look at something. Well, hang on, wait there. Can okay. you still hear me? I can hear you. Right. Here's something, right? Now I know that you. I know it's on radio, but can you see that? Can you make that out? It looks like a Czech Bank of America. It's a check from Bob Hope for a thousand dollars. That so this is in eighty four, nineteen eighty four. My dad wrote for him, and Bob Hope at the end of the gig gave my dad a check for a thousand dollars, which was what the fee was. Yeah. But he gave him two checks, and um, and my dad's like, "Why are you giving me two checks?" He said, "Well, you're not. You can't tell me that you're not going to keep this check as a souvenir, right?" So oh, he wow. gave his writers two checks, knowing they could cash one and they could keep one. And uh, my mum one Christmas about five or six years ago, found the check and had it printed, had it um, framed. And it's, I love it. It's my pride and joy. And I tell that story. And I wow. told my mum when we were writing the book, I told her about this story that I just put in the book about the two checks. And, you know, that means that he can cash one check and he can keep a signed Bob Hope check for posterity. 
And then Mark said, that's not what happened at all. He said, well, what we did, we took the bank, the check down to the bank. I said, when you've cashed this and it's gone through the process, can we have it back? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I believe, I think I'm going to keep my story for the book because it's, it's, it's more romantic. Yeah. But um, yeah, he rang up my dad uh, one night, maybe, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning um, from California. So what is that? Probably seven o'clock at night over there. And he was doing a gig and something had happened in America. He wanted a topical joke for it. And he rang my dad. This is 1984. There's wow. no internet. It's in the middle of the morning. My dad knew nothing about what was going on. So, uh, yeah. So he was, uh, but, but that's why my dad was successful because he was a great writer. But comedians and people like to have him around. There's a great story when he was doing a show with Bradley Walsh. And they had a, a joke. Uh, a joke didn't get the laugh that Brad thought it would get. This was on television. And Brad comes off the stage and says something to my dad about the joke not working and um and my dad said it's not the joke bradley it's the way you told it you know blaming the comic <laughs> as comics and writers do they've been doing it for generations and my and bradley walsh said something to my dad about being a sh- short gingerhead glaswegian barrel chested <laughs> just like an insult after insult and my dad turned around and said to bradley walsh you're nothing but a flat-nosed cockney chancer ex-footballer who slipped into show business and somehow made a few bob and they argued about this but not in a in a hallway but on the taxi going to the hotel um at the end of the recording so they're in the car the driver brad and my dad in the back and bradley's still stewing a little bit and said to my dad you know i'm not the funniest man in the world charlie and my dad said bradley you're not the funniest man in this cab <laughs> brilliant you know but, and then having said that um and this is how Dad sticks in. There was a, have you seen the documentary about Jimmy Tarbuck that was on TV last year? I haven't, no. no. Well, watch it. And, and Bradley, you know how they, they do these documentaries and there's a few famous people that are talking about the subject? Yep. And Bradley's one of the guys that's talking about it. And they're talking about the live from shows when Tarbuck did the live from the Palladium and Her Majesty's and stuff like that. And my dad was involved in all those shows. And Bradley said, I'll never forget that. Jimmy Tarbuck, you know, it, it was so up to the minute. He'd come off from doing uh, Bringing On Whoever the Act Was and he'd go into the wings and there'd be the comedy writers, all of them standing there, Charlie Adams. Doesn't mention any other one. Just mention my dad. And I've got goosebumps saying that because writers don't get, over here, writers don't get the credit that they do in America. You know, the, the writers in America on The Tonight Show or Late Show, whatever they do, yeah. they, get, they, get, they, they get paid well. They get looked after. They're almost revered, as they should be. Over here, they're kind of hidden away. I feel a rant coming on. <laughs> <laughs> I miss him. I miss him terribly, as you can imagine. I'm sure you do. Was it your dad that inspired you to go into comedy? No, he used to write for a lot of comics. So comedians are always around our house. And one day I was going for an exam. Uh, I was going to go do a geography exam at school and a history exam. And my dad and a comedian Shane Ritchie were playing table tennis in the back garden when I left for school. And when I come home at the end of the school day, they're still playing table tennis. And I was like, well, I want, I want that job. And, but Shane had been a blue coat at Pontins and he told me about that job. And I wanted, then I wanted that job. And uh, so I, I um, Shane took me to my audition for Pontins and I got the job before I'd even walked through the door. Cause I was with Shane Ritchie, who was a legend at that Pontins. And, um, but I couldn't start work straight away cause I was going to finish school. Then I decided not to finish school. And I got a job at Warner instead um, because Pontins had a job ready for me two months later. So like dad, I mean, he did inspire me, obviously, but he, what he didn't do is he didn't say, like a lot of fathers, well, why don't you finish school first? No, I, I want to be a blue coat. It's, it's £65 a week. Yeah, I want to do that. Okay, do that. And I didn't finish school. And I, But the other thing is, I've, I've never gone back, and that was 31 years ago. That's, so I've done, done it all. I've done okay. Is it going to be the cruise ships when all this is over, when you're going back to full time? Yeah, are you going was, back on the ships again? I was, yeah, I was hoping to get more into the writing and start a little side business I'd had an idea of for a little while. Um, but but now I, it's all about recouping losses and keeping a, a roof over my children's head. So I'll be going back to the ships quite a lot, I'd imagine. Do you know what we had Paul back on? He was talking about he didn't quit the ships. He retired after 18 years, and he was talking about so hard to go into something else after the money he'd made on the ship, yeah. especially his cruise director that come down off the ship. It's the lifestyle, though, isn't it? The lifestyle is, you know, I, the hardest thing for me over lockdown has been having the same view every day. I've just not used to that. I would cruise, probably do something like maybe 30 a year. Nowadays, it's all over the world. So to wake up every morning and just see Rochester, 
I mean, Rochester's beautiful, but it's like, okay, I've seen this now. Where can I go? The other week when we were finally allowed out, I just got in the car, I drove to York, and then I went out to Edinburgh for a few days, and I came back, went to Lincoln, and it was it's like a, well, it was a holiday. So that that's, a, but it's not really, I mean, you say it's tough. Come on, look, I'm healthy. I'm here. So there's a million people way worse off than me. So I'm not, I'm not moaning. So the book, the writing of the book, you're still working yeah. on that? I could, again, I was going to go and show you. No, it's pretty much done. Now, today we've been doing this this little chapter. It's all edited. Um, lockdown, what lockdown has given me is um, the opportunity to sit down and do, because I can write, but then I want to find out something. Like I was in this chapter today, I was talking about the Latin word for distractions. Well, on a ship, you've got no way of finding that out. So that was a reason for me not to write the whole chapter. Okay, I won't bother. So here, there's, now there's no excuses. If I'm going to write a book about my dad, I can go online, I can Google Charlie Adams, and I can find out everything that I don't know about him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's, and because and, time was never the issue. You know, on a ship, I didn't do much. I didn't have many hours. In fact, I don't think I ever did an hour. It was a poor excuse, but I've really rattled on. Before. And now I've got other ideas. I had a, on my website, oh, look, I might do a little plug. On my website, Paul Adams Comedy, pauladamscomedy.com, there's a page that is a, I wrote a diary of a lockdown comedian in November last year. So I did like 28 entries. So that was quite funny. And it's on my Instagram, which is Paul Adams Comedy as well. And I had to record these videos. I'm, I shouldn't say this, but they're, but they're funny. So that's been written. The book's been written. I've got, my next book is going to be um, uh, something along the lines of I've enjoyed my enforced gap year. Because that's what I'm pretending this is. I never had a gap year. You know, people go to school and have a gap year, then they start work. This is my gap year. So I'm going to write something about that. And then um, I've got an idea for another book, which is a follow-on from a book that my dad wrote with Hale and Pace. Do you remember Hale and Pace? I remember yeah, Gareth Hale and Norman Pace. My, my dad wrote a book with them called Falsies, Forged Diaries of the Famous. And um, so I think I'm going to try it. I've spoken to Gareth and Norman about my dad for the book. And I told him maybe I'll do a Falsies too. So I might, I might do that. I'm just keeping myself busy. And all of this writing doesn't pay a penny. <laughs> Well, do you know what? You're talking about John Martin earlier. John was on. He's wrote a book. I'm not sure whether it's out yet. Mr. Tarbuck, I want to be a comedian. Talking to Tarbuck. Oh. John wrote some comedy as well for, for Tarbuck too. That's right. He was um, he was on the YTS, wasn't he? Or whatever that... It was like a little... Um... We spoke about that. What it was, John was the first ever entertainer to um, go on the £40 a week enterprise allowance scheme. I got on it myself as a singer. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I got on it as well. We were discussing about people not taking our profession seriously oh, that's not a real job you we've all had that right it's not a real job john was saying when he went yeah. to the job center in bootle uh, on merseyside <laughs> he had the the plan and all that his business plan and then he said to the girl yeah i want to be a comedian and she said to him you're trying to be funny he said well i am actually <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah he no, was on that yeah in yeah. liverpool you know sometimes you know you're, you generally if you do a show you're the funniest person in the room right yeah. But in Liverpool, you're not even in the top half. <laughs> you know, I've played the Philharmonic Halls a lot, and I, and sometimes I, I just know I'm not. John Martin, I'm sure he won't mind me telling him yep. you this story. Okay. But we did a cruise on the Carousel, which is a sister ship to the Sea Wing, and um, in '96, and um, we didn't we didn't hit it off, John and I. Uh, we now get on great, and he's a he's a gentleman. He really I need to say that he's a gentleman, but he was very. Uh, protective of his material so when i was getting ready for my show he came in and told me what i could and couldn't talk about i was like okay we'll do that it's fine because as far as i was concerned he was john martin what he says goes and uh, so i did my show then he did his show and he standing room only he got a standing ovation he was sensational and i had a show after him i did two shows for less money than he did for getting one on his (laughs) four pound a week scheme anyway (laughs) um... (laughs) but he said so in, in my second show i'm doing my stuff now john martin he had, I don't know if he still holds it, I'm pretty sure he does, but he has the record for telling uh, jokes for the longest time. 101 hours, 39 minutes. Right. Before I forget, let me tell you this okay. little bit. We were talking about lockdown over here and lockdown back home, right? We're back to 100% now, so I've been back working since October doing live okay. gigs. And I was telling John about, the, he did 25% capacity, then we went 50% capacity. And then the mayor of Texas in March, just before Paddy's Day, said uh, 100% capacity. And I work in an Irish place, right? So we were slammed. And I played 1 p.m. till 8 p.m. that day. I played. That's oh, how long the gig was, yeah. So I was telling John, I said, yeah, now we're 100%. I said, I played 1 p.m. till 8 p.m. And John said, uh, not 101 hours and 39 minutes, no? <laughs> <laughs> After our little kind of... 
a chat about what I could do and what I couldn't do. I did. He did his show. I did my show. We didn't clash on anything because both of us write stuff. Yep. And I had to do another show. So I'm doing my show. And I, I don't remember why. But for some reason, John is at the back of the room and he heckled me. Right? <laughs> he heckled me. Now, and I'm like, well, hang on. In my head, I'm going, you're John Martin. Why are you heckling me? You've done what? So because I'm me, I'm, I, was, I used to be a nice guy. I, I said to the crowd, oh, ladies and gentlemen, John Martin at the back of the room there. John Martin. Remember John Martin? And the whole place goes nuts for him again because he'd done such a good show. I said, John Martin holds a world record for telling jokes. How many was it? 103 hours, was it? It was 101 hours, 39 minutes. 101 hours and 39 minutes. Yeah. How about that? 101 hours, 39 minutes. And the room claps. I said, I bet you think twice before you shout more next time. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember John Martin just looking at me and just going... <laughs> it wasn't rude, but it was like... John, it's my turn now. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but it's a sensational comic. I'll end by saying that because otherwise I sound mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ring him and see if he'll listen to this. You're probably <laughs> on the phone in a bit. It's a good point. Do you remember that time on the Sea Wing where I did you? I said, let's stay up. Let's see how long we can stay up. And we finished the show and we went drinking around the ship. Then we were on the back deck. We sailed into Rhodes when the sun came up. Then went out for breakfast. Do you remember that? I do. But what happened when we came back from breakfast? Because we went for a full English and we got something like grapes, ham, and an egg. <laughs> right? It was like, it was, this is not even, this is neither full nor English. This is rubbish. And we went back a, a few months beforehand. I'd had my passport stolen. And it, was, it had been stolen by a bad guy. So in some countries, immigration wanted to have a look at me just to make sure I wasn't whoever this guy was. And when we, you must remember this. We went, back into the, we went back to the ship and I was taken by the purser. I wasn't allowed on the ship. I was taken straight down the gangway and to this little immigration office. And we're not well. We'd been up all night. We're tired, sweaty. It's roads. It's really hot. And this immigration guy is just having a go at me. And mid, mid torrent of abuse, I just pump up this little whatever cushion and lay down and fall asleep <laughs> in the middle of the interrogation. Because I remember coming back from there and I crashed in the cabin for the whole day because yeah. we had the show that night. But it was fun. It wasn't. It was. It wasn't. We weren't. We just had a laugh. We we got on straight away. I don't even remember. Yeah. I don't remember our first conversation, but I just remember we had a laugh. I'm trying to get better with the social media. My son, he turns 13 in a couple of weeks, and he has never really cared for what I do. I don't even know if he knows what I do. And, and we were chatting one day, and he's talking about some guy. I don't know his name, Mr. A, who's got something like 25 million YouTube subscribers. And my little girl says, "Daddy's on YouTube." And Thomas was like, "You're on YouTube, Daddy." I went, "Yeah." He said, how many subscribers have you got? Because uh, Mr. A's got 25 million. How many have you got? I said, 27. <laughs> and he went, 27 million? And he's, he's so proud of his dad. And he immediately goes onto his phone and starts looking for Paul Adams comedy. And then he looks at me with a look of disgust and went, oh, just 27. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's funny? Because I've just started doing a bit of work on my YouTube channel because I just used to put the odd music video on it did or the odd live gig. I get a lot of messages saying, oh, we'd like to hear that interview. You know, we'd like to hear that interview again. So what I've started doing, I've started putting the radio interviews on my YouTube channel. I'd have got to that. Name yeah. the shirt. Is that a rugby shirt? Yeah. Harlequins, baby. Champions. I finally found a team that I support that won something after all my years as a Crystal Palace fan. You don't change allegiance. I was, in, I was a Liverpool fan until I was 11 and realised I couldn't go every week. And I chose my local team and it happened to be Crystal Palace. Well, that's fair play because, you know, you, you're from there. You live there, so... And we, and we did. We've, we've, we've played our part in ruining Liverpool's lives. We, we, we knocked you out of... We, we knocked you out of the FA Cup in 1990. And not only did we knock you out of the FA Cup, we let Man United win. And had they lost that game, Alex Ferguson would have been fired. So we've ruined Liverpool... And then a few years ago, didn't we beat you at Sellers Park in a game that was that you you shouldn't have lost and you were heading to the title? It was 3-3. Three, three. We were 3-1 three, up and you come back and scored two goals and ended up 3-3. Three, three. But I've got yeah. to say right now, Jurgen Klopp, is he not the most... He's, he's the manager that football needs, not you guys. He's a manager that football needs. He's such a personality. I love him. Football player of all time was Stevie Nicol. What a player. Yeah. Great yeah, defender, could get Lee, forward. Like well. Sammy Lee, did you say? I used to love watching Sammy Lee. I couldn't work out how somebody so little was allowed to play with the big boys. So talking to Sammy Lee is a quick story for you. I was at a game, Liverpool-Everton, and in the night time I had a gig. I was in a duo with a friend of mine, Gary MacDonald. We were called the Culprits. So we had a gig that night. I always remember it was the Parkside Century Club in Bootle, in Liverpool. 
So during this game, and we were both at the game, during the game, the ball goes out. And this little chubby little kid runs on, little toddler. And he runs on and kicks the ball back to Neville Southall, this little kid. His dad put him on the pitch. All the Everton fans started singing, Sammy Lee, Sammy Lee, Sammy Lee. <laughs> <the kids. laughs> that night, I've got a gig in the Parkside Club. So we set our stuff up and he goes to the bar, me and Gary. And uh, we got song to this guy at the bar. And the guy goes, yeah. hey, oh, are you the act tonight, lads? Yeah, yeah. So he's at the bar having a pint, this guy. And he says, um, just follow the football. He said, yeah, we were at the game today. He said, you see the kid run on? I said, that was hysterical. The Evertonian singing there, Sammy Lee. He said, that was my son. I said, what? He said, it was me who put him on. <laughs> so the thousands and thousands of people in that stadium, at Anfield that day, he said, yeah. He said, when I got home, he said, my missus always records the games. VHS then. That's how far back we're going here. <laughs> he said, my little kid ran in and said to me, wife, did you tape the game? Yeah, yeah. Rewind, rewind, rewind. Said, Why? He said, my wife knew because you watched the game, but the chances of that, unbelievable. That's brilliant. You but, can't um, beat the humour. The humour, we're even talking funny stuff. Crowds are funny. Football crowds are just funny. The lads over here, the supporters club over here in Texas, you know, Roy Yates, our um, yeah. mutual yeah, friend. Yeah, he on, on the ceiling when I worked here, but not your, when it was the company before yours. Yeah, well, Roy, I met Roy a few years ago. He lives in Fort Lauderdale. He brings the... He married an American person, as far as I remember. But Roy, Roy brings all the, um, the players over here for the Legends Nights. And I've had some great nights. You know, we've had Gary Gillespie. Gary was fantastic. Uh, I did a gig uh, with John Barnes, was the last one I did. But he brought Stevie Nichol over. He took him out drinking all day. And by the time he got up to tell the stories, he told the same story three or four times. He was hammered. <laughs> Stevie's been over here. I wasn't at that one, actually, but the lads were telling me, you know. But uh, Roy Yates, yeah, our friend Roy, he brings all the players over here. Yeah, he was, I think he was the first cruiser I ever worked with, I think, in 95, so... He was. I never felt so old. I felt fine before he did this show. <laughs> now I feel old. And I, and, I, and I can see a picture of me and my, I've got a beard and it's so grey. Look at that. You used to have the, uh, you used to have the little crew cut, didn't you, when we were on a ship? I've, I, never, I never really had hair. I went bald <laughs> very early. I remember my mate um, had a tall girlfriend. His girlfriend was about 6'2". And we were walking somewhere, and she said to me, hey, Paul, you're losing your hair. And I turned to my mate and said, you've got to get a shorter girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but my, apparently, my, my uncles were bald very early, and I, I lost my hair very quickly. And um, I was probably, so when we met in, 90, in 2002, I was probably coming close to shaving it, which like it is now. But you've got to work your way down to that. But I always had rubbish hair. I was quite happy with it. When... Now, just out of interest, when John Martin was on the show, how long did he do? How long was his segment? John, I'm going to say 45 minutes, 50 minutes maybe, because he told a lot have, of gags. Have we done longer than John? I think we've been on about, we're close. I think we're close. Close to an hour. As long as I've beaten John, I have to say I've got the world record of <laughs> ex T wing comedians on a Joe Walmsley show. The funny thing about you and me chatting here, it's been a while since we've, we've had a talk now. All the stories, we've shared a lot of stories and reminisced a lot today. I didn't know where I was going with John. Because an example, I live in San Antonio, Texas. So my missus and me, good few years back, probably 2007, 2008, Phil Collins comes here every year. Because he's, oh, really? well, he's part of the Alamo. He owns all the memorabilia. So what? He, yeah, he's a big Alamo fan since a kid. So he comes every year. And this one time, we, we lived around the corner from the Alamo at the time. He <laughs> came to do a speech, and he was the speaker for the descendants, the families of the descendants. So, you know, they're all got passes on to get in. So my wife just wants to see Phil Collins. So she goes over to the ranger and says, can we come in, you know, we're from England. And, uh, you know, English died in the Alamo too. Oh, it's, it's uh, invite only. Yeah, but it's not fair because we, we live here. And, and the Texas ranger, if there's any seats, maybe. Anyway, she goes, there's some seats at the back come in. So he stands up and there's Phil there, us in the Alamo with Phil. So it was yeah. all Hispanic people. Phil, Michelle, and me inside the Alamo, right? So I'm telling John, because John is a big history buff. And he's been over here. I, I, I showed him around the Alamo. He's a big history buff, John. He's like, really? I said, yeah, we got in there. And Phil Collins was saying, I don't want to talk about music or the radio or the TV. I'm here for the Alamo. That's all he wanted to talk about. And the people, was like, so when he read the English names out, and you stand up, there was Phil, my missus, and me. 
So John's yeah. like, wow, really? I said, yeah. He said, well, did you just rush in there? Like, did you just rush in and, and take a seat? I said, no, the Ranger let us in. He said, because I heard that Phil Collins turned around to your missus and said, you can't hurry, love. <laughs> Are you kidding me? To keep you going that long for that story that he says that. But I love people coming up. Now, I don't encourage this. I'm quite good at making it clear to audiences on ships that they shouldn't approach me ever after the show. <laughs> Right, because I'm busy, but I do like so don't I don't encourage people to do this, but um, I do like hearing people's versions of jokes. When someone comes up to me and says, Hey, Paul, I've got a joke for you, I, I don't tire of that. I love to hear it, yeah. I love to hear how they ruin it or how they make it even better. You know, how I remember a guy telling me a joke once before my show, and he told me one of my jokes, but he made it last about three minutes, and I make it last about six seconds. <laughs> oh my God. But if he hadn't done it, he'd have, he'd have gone around the ship saying, that's my joke. And I don't I don't mind. A kid once, I don't know if this will work on here. A kid once came up to me after the show. I'm, I've just left the, the theatre. I'm in my suit. And he pulls on the, my jacket. Hey, Mr. Comedian, can I tell you a joke? I said, of course you can. And he says, um, I don't know if this will work. Um, he'll say, he says, uh, two drums and a cymbal fell off a cliff. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. And I laughed so hard. And these two guys are walking past. Said, what are you laughing at? I said, this kid just told me the best joke I've ever heard. He said, what's the joke? And I look at the kid and I said, tell the gentleman your joke. And the kid looks at me. This is an important joke. The kid looks at me and says, no, no, you tell them. You're the professional. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how much you remember about my show, but there's not many jokes in it because I'm not very good with actual jokes. You're the storyteller. I, I look, yeah, I can yeah. just, you know, I'm just funny. I don't know that I'm necessarily telling joke jokes. So if a joke has to be in a certain order, I'm going to get it wrong. So the kid says, you tell them, you're the professional. So look at the guy. I said, two drums and a cymbal fell off a cliff. But dum boom but dum ba dum boom dush, dush, dush. What was he again? And I got it completely wrong. And the kid just looks at me and rolls his eyes and walks away. Well, you say never work with kids or animals. Apparently so. I did the gig not so long ago and someone come in. I thought it was the girl's backpack, I've got to be honest. It was a miniature monkey. Because I've seen it move and I'm like, that's a monkey. It's not a backpack. And she come over as I was playing and... She put it right by me, and it's looking at me. And it's like, <laughs> I was terrified. I'm standing holding the guitar going, Jesus, this thing's going to attack me. She, no, he'll be fine. He, he loves music. I thought it was going to be like a tag, like Joe <laughs> no, <from> Martin. <laughs> that's just what happened. It's true. I thought you were going to say it was Davy Jones. What was it like, Davy Jones? Oh, was, was oh, like Davy Jones and the monkeys? No, this was a real uh, genuine little monkey. He's little. He could be in a woman's backpack. <laughs> Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate, and a lot of fun, and I appreciate you joining us. Every 20 years is fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get you over here to uh, Texas and take you to Austin. We'll do that. I'll do a spot at Waxy's. We can sort that for sure. Yeah. All right, mate. Paul, thanks, mate. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, Anytime. buddy. Thanks, Love mate. To the family. You too. Bye.